make sure the time gets oh, kept yes. and uh, yes. and send us off to the the rest it's of the building. It's already <laughs> six minutes under there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are, we are way behind the uh, schedule, so we have to keep it uh, short and sweet. Um, my name is Amir Paiva. I'm a business correspondent with the BBC, but for the f next 40 minutes, I'm here in my personal capacity because of my passion for transport and logistics. Uh, just under two weeks ago, a few weeks ago, I was in Germany doing some reports before the German elections, and I had the pleasure of riding on an IC train all the way through in Germany, ending up in Port of Hamburg, which are the main um, rivals, if I may say, to the Port of Antwerp, loving all those big ships and trains. I'm a transport buff, that's why I'm here. We have a fantastic uh, panel today to discuss uh, Iran's um, priorities and needs when it comes to infrastructure to do with transport. Uh, to my left, uh, to my immediate left, is Wilm uh, Dillon, Head of uh, Business Development, Port of Antwerp. We have Paddy de moini uh Vice President of Mobility, uh, Siemens uh, Iran. Uh, we have uh, Carl, Carsten Leuters, Head of Solutions Supply Chain Management from KPMG. And last not, but not least, Maurice de Kock, um, Director of Business Development from Van Oort who will tell us uh, very briefly in the next um, 40 minutes uh, what Iran needs when it comes to the infrastructure. Um, so with a broad brush starting question, um, when, I, when I look at Iran's ports, let's start with the sea and then we, w we make our work through to the, to the mainland and the railway network as well. Uh, and compare Iranian ports, say, with Jebel Ali, not far from Iran. Uh, why is why do you think Iran's ports are underdeveloped, if we may say so? Uh, is it because of volume that we don't have as much trade as it goes through <coughs> Jebel Ali, for example? Or is it a question of infrastructure, that it hasn't been historically developed enough for, for it to receive so much um, um, trade, starting with Will? I think that um, uh, for Iran, uh, it, it is uh, a bit of both. Uh, uh, being, let's say, uh, under sanctions for so long, ha uh, it clearly has had this effect on the investments that were made. And if there's one conclusion that we can say after visiting, visiting several ports, um, there is a need to update and to develop further the infrastructure, uh, the port infrastructure, which the, uh, Iran has today. On the other hand, there's a second thing, which is that, uh, like Jebel Ali, uh, today in shipping, um, there is, in fact, uh, a number of hubs throughout the world that have been uh, performing very well, but basically grow exponentially due to the fact that they so many uh, carriers call on those ports. They have become hubs. So I think the biggest challenge for uh, Iran uh, may be that it uh, <coughs> wants to position itself as a future hub, not only for Iran, but all the surrounding countries. And it has a huge potential there. Do you think there is still room for a second major hub next to Jebel Ali in Persian Gulf? I think yes, uh, without any doubt. Uh, if you look at Northwest Europe, you have several major hubs on a very short distance. So I don't see uh, really any uh, reason why it should not be the case. Um, I think it's also good for business to have several <coughs> options. To my feeling, and I come from a background of, uh, let's say, the shippers world, not the carriers world, um, uh, the, the mere fact that you have several options uh, is also something that is taken into account in supply chain management and the risk management that goes with it. So yes, uh, uh, Iran can take a stronger position as a major hub in the Middle East. Any of the other members? Yeah, the as a uh, construction firm, I can fully support what has been said. Um, the infrastructure needs an upgrade. I mean, vessels are getting larger and larger, and some of the ports are not accessible for the major uh, vessels that uh, currently operate. Uh, besides also the export and import of gas and oil through pipelines and SPMs, that infrastructure is already, let's say, waiting uh, almost a decade to be upgraded. 
I mean, we have been working there for ages. I mean, our company's been there for the last 20, 30 years. In the last decade, we almost did nothing, and so did our competitors. We were not allowed and able to work there. And there is a lot of demand. I mean, we have lots of tenders and requests, and yeah, we are about to uh, pull up our sleeves and start. So yes, the infrastructure needs an upgrade, definitely. I want to yeah. What we see our customer right, they ask us also for support, whether there is a need of investment of uh, rail infrastructure behind the ports. They are not really sure how the operation model looks really like. So they ask us for best practice models like Port of Antwerp, Port of Hamburg. Uh, is it profitable to have a rail infrastructure behind their port? At the moment, we see that there is a lack of capacity and uh, there is a need of investment, but also a lack of knowledge about where to invest and in which infrastructure to invest, in road or rail. I agree totally with what all of you have said, because I think a port is not a, a standalone. So we need this Hinterlandverkehr and all this other stuff. And if you look also on the geographical um, of the geographic of, of Iran, we have in the center Tehran with, uh, let me say, around about 25% of the people, but 50% of the buying power. So we need a good connection also to this city and to all the other ones. And we need the embedding into the in total infrastructure with the uh, trains, with road and other carriers. So this, what has been mentioned as a multimodal um, access, I think this is also necessary to have a solution which is really sustainable for Iran for the future. What is lacking is the intermodal infrastructure. So what we see in Europe are the intermodal hubs. And at the moment we have just Aprin, but uh, we proposed that um, Iran develops a logistics master plan. And at the moment they are discussing with two players from Germany in order to set up a logistics master plan in order to define more logistic hubs and multimodal hubs in Iran. Now, interestingly, it's not about just Iran. Uh, the port of Hamburg, there were, there were two concerns, even in the port of Hamburg, which is one of the three top big ports in Northern <coughs> Europe. One was that the railway connections to the port could not supply as much containers and trade which was going through the port. And the second was the dredging of, <laughs> of the port. They constantly want the river Elbe to get wider and deeper for bigger and bigger vessels. So it is a apparently a universal issue, and the approach of an integrated uh, expansion of uh, transport hubs to look at it as a hub which is integrated, combines road, rail, and uh, ports, obviously, is uh, important. Talking of which, um, again, I want a very broad picture when we come to railway in Iran. I've since my teen years, I've always had this question. A country like Iran, which is strategically located, as we heard from the last uh, speech, uh, so vast, and it's f it was no brainer to me that it is a prime country for a massive railway network, yet still very, very underdeveloped. Can you, uh, Padida, please tell us why do you think that's been the case? And what are the potentials for this network to grow? Yeah, so it is easy to say if we take a look at the sixth development plan, then we see that the government wants to allocate 1% of their oil revenues for the rail infrastructure. There is a willingness to invest in rail infrastructure. They want to uh, upgrade the current infrastructure, but also to expand the rail network from 10,000 kilometers to 15,000 kilometers. They are defining main corridors like Tehran Mashhad, Tehran Isfahan, uh, Gamsar in Cheborun. Financing comes from China, from uh, Russia, but also for, for the suprastructure. They are asking also Siemens for providing uh, some, some uh, suprastructure. Um, so they are asking for 28,000 freight cars, for example, uh, shunting uh, locomotives, 600 locomotives. So there is a massive plan, but the budget is limited. So they need 25 billion euros until 2025 in order to invest in this infrastructure. But at the moment, they have yearly 900 million euros in order to invest, but they would need 3 billion yearly. And there we see a gap. And this means for all infrastructure projects that are asking for finance. So for all projects, we need really to think about how to 
bring finance in order to um, ensure that the infrastructure, uh, that we can invest in the infrastructure. I would comment on that, that also I would say that making the domestic network better and improve it is one side, but on the other side we have also to link it with the uh, other uh, countries and there fortunately we have this problem with different gauges so that we need um, um, uh, different um, technical e equipment to change trains either between Russia and Iran or between uh, Pakistan and Iran. And the other one, and I think we don't have to underestimate it, that we have to link it with also the trans-European and the, um, the, the, the rail link between China and, and Europe. And therefore, I think the um, influence also f coming from the East, from China with the uh, new uh, invention of, or reinvention of the Silk Road and also the investments of, of India. We are talking here on an European Iran forum, but I think it, it is, we have to see it also on a global scale. Yeah, but Iran defined the south-north corridor and the east-west corridors from Mashhad to Tehran, Tehran, Tabriz, and um, they are promoting it. Mr. Ashuri from Rai, he is really a good promoter, and um, at the moment they are talking with Deutsche Bahn in order to set up corridors from Hamburg, from Duisport, through uh, Caspian Sea to Iran. Well, looking at it more regionally, like you mentioned, which is very important, like um, initiatives like the One Belt, One Road, connecting China to Europe, uh, so on so forth, you would see w w what you say. So we have this very underdeveloped infrastructure, and we have this huge opportunity. So again, it looks like a no-brainer that where either the, if not the Iranian government doesn't have the money, that there will be investment <coughs> opportunities for uh, other investors, or even governments, like we see with the port of Chabahar, that, for example, all of a sudden India is interested to develop it because it's in a strategic interest. What do we see in that sphere? So either from a major private sector, non-Iranian investors or governments, in ports or with railway uh, investments? I think um, if, if you look at the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the Chinese initiative, uh, it is a very strong uh, visionary project uh, of, the, of China and its president. Uh, I think uh, w you can be in favor or non not in favor. As ports go, we are, let's say, uh, very uh, interested in maritime flows, but we cannot live without good connectivity to the hinterland. Rail, barge, short sea, pipeline, whatever, we need that because a port is only as good as it is capable in evacuating cargo coming in or receiving cargo coming out. So that being said, I think personally, uh, if I uh, read the intentions of the Chinese government well, that they are willing to co-invest to a large extent to realize any such Silk Road revival. Um, also, what I would like to mention at this stage is that uh, if we talked in the beginning that the port's infrastructure structure needs revamping and developing in Iran, and I think we all agree on that, that basically includes not only the waterside mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure, but also the hinterland uh, <coughs> connectivity, I would like to say that there is another issue coming up than only taking back your place. And that is that in the current day and age, uh, with ships growing larger and larger, there's a specific burden put on the land side of port operations, because if you receive, for instance, vessels from 22,000 TEU, uh, soon to be there, we had uh, a very big one, Madrid Maersk, only a couple of weeks ago in Antwerp, that accounted for 10,000 moves putting cargo on and uh, off the, the vessel in a very short period of time. So it's not only more cargo, but you have to be able to deal with the peak moments which have grown exponentially due to the size of vessels. So the challenges in that respect are becoming bigger. And that is what we hope to be able to address and why we as the Port of Antwerp have a good relationship with Iranian ports and offer assistance in developing that. What we see at the moment in Iran is that um, 
They prefer financing from China and Russia because via Siemens, we proposed also financing from Germany for main corridors. Uh, we defined for us a list of 120 prioritization projects for Iran. And we talked with the ministries, with Dr. Akhundi, about all those projects and also told that we are willing to bring finance from Germany, but at the moment they really prefer to have financing from China and Russia. Why do you think is, um, is that's the case? It, it is uh, more attractive, I think, because of the interest rates and uh, because also of the long uh, good partnership with China and uh, Russia uh, during the sanction periods. I think there are, there are several reasons behind, but um, one of them is for sure that during the sanction times, Chinese really supported Iran, and uh, they are good alliance and partners. Um, maybe, maybe if I may add uh, yes, on this uh, sure. global scale, because if you look at the OBOR, also to Pakistan, we've been working last year very heavily in Pakistan, the whole port of Kashim area has been upgraded in joint cooperation, uh, Chinese, Pakistani, and European uh, funding, to make that happen. So I think similar approach can be very successful, could be very successful in Iran. Well, you mentioned, uh, I mean, we, we mentioned a few, a um, couple of barriers to, to investment. Um, um, so so in a very larger, larger scale. Uh, but what, what other barriers have you faced um, in your work with, uh, with, Ira with Iranian um, entities? And also, um, what kind of like partnership models do you think they prefer, apart from the fact that, well, they definitely want a, a favor Chinese um, um, finance. So what they ask for is normally PPP models. So they prefer BOT models. If you take a look at Imam Khomeini Airport, there also they ask for a BOT uh, model concerning airlines. Uh, it seems that there is a leasing company somewhere in Dubai and, uh, um, they asked also us to uh, provide uh, financing through BOT model, and we <coughs> developed a model, but um, we were really not able to find investors um, investing in this SPC, so special purpose companies. Um, at the moment, it is a little bit difficult to compare the air, uh, airlines with, with trains, because if you develop a train, it is really fitted to Iran. Uh, the toilets are uh, the Iranian toilets. Uh, you need a water, water volume, which is uh, needed for Iran's uh, climate. And uh, we cannot bring the train out of Iran and, to, and sell it somewhere else. Uh, with the airlines, it's a little bit different. So mm -hmm. it is a little bit difficult to talk about BOT models uh, if we talk about uh, trains. But perhaps KPMG can support us. <laughs> I think there is a FIPA, Foreign Investment Promotion and Protection Act, in, uh, in place, which equals foreigners and domestic people instead, uh, I think, except uh, in, in property. I think this is a very good basis so that we can uh, work on that. But on the other hand, I think it's also uh, something, um, is the access to this new technology and to let it work there. You said something about climate, of course, yes, but I think uh, all these uh, manufacturers, either of trains or um, other um, equipment, are aware of that. What I more see is, of course, that we need, based on, on, based on the economic and political um, um, situation that we need a long-term orientation in, in investing. It's not something we, we do in uh, five or ten years, and I think ports count on 50 or 100 years. Uh, I know that no one can look as far as, so, uh, as 50 years into the future, but if we could do that at least five to ten years, I think it would make it a little bit easier and the risk mitigation would, be, would come down, of course. Well, do you think, um, I mean, there's, there's always been a sensitivity towards the infrastructure like this, like ports um, or airports. So do you think probably part of it, the, the fact that they want you to build, operate, and then transfer the ownership and say goodbye, is because the uh, Iranian government wants to, the, the state wants eventually to have control over these main hubs in terms of ownership and operation. So uh, historically, we saw a problem with the uh, Imam Khomeini Airport, for example, where the Turkish came in, or uh, one of the main um, ports uh, in, in the country during the sanctions period was suspected of being controlled by a certain entity. So do you think is there is 
that kind of sensitivity to infrastructure, which is holding back from investment? Um, I think it's, it's, there are different types of ports. You have private ports, you have the public ports, and so forth. I think it makes sense for Iran to uh, keep control of uh, their ports. Eh? Th that's, that's uh, I think, a given. Uh, since they need to serve a multi-purpose, uh, the port of Antwerp is a multi-purpose port, and we work under the landlord model, but we don't reside under uh, the Ministry of Transport federal, eh? we have a, let's say, a fairly uh, special model which works for us. Eh? Uh, but I think basically, if you look at, at uh, the essentials here, uh, it m I, I think it makes sense for I Iran to uh, run and manage uh, in whatever way they choose fit uh, their own ports. Um, at least we as Port of Antwerp don't have the ambition to uh, let's say, uh, to contribute more than our expertise. We are very open and willing. We have closed an MOU with the port of Bandar Abbas, uh, and we, we offer consultancy and training services out of our own experience. We do not have the interest of, let's say, as a port, take over that. And I think it would not be in the interest of Iran itself either. I think we have similar experience in port uh, developments that in a PPP construction, uh, if you have a, a team that operates the uh, authorities, and you have concessions in place, you can have these long-term arrangements. And we're not talking about a decade, we're talking about at least two decades, 20 to 30 years concession periods mm -hmm. in which we can build, construct, operate for that year together in a team. And we do that. We also participate actively with equity. We are risk sharing and it's all about the risk. How big is the risk appetite within each partner and how much appetite does he or she wants to take up and in? Have you been thinking of a model whereby financing comes from China and technology uh, and, and the rest from a European com uh, company? So, so joining these two together so that it both uh, resolves the financing issue and then also the I mean, we, the Iranians historically want to be working with European companies. It's a, it's a no-brainer. Siemens has a long history in, in Iran. Do you think there is an opportunity there? Sure. Th currently, we are just talking about those projects. This means financing comes from Russia or from uh, China, and we uh, provide the superstructure locomotives or the trains then from Europe. But financing mm -hmm. comes from other countries. I would also suggest that, of course, the pure import of, of um, equipment makes sense for the first step, but then I think it is necessary also to bring in parts of the supply chain, of the value chain, into the country, so that, for example, 60%, uh, 70% of the equipment will be also built in, uh, in Iran to build up, let me say, an own sustainable um, industrial manufacturing in that because um, after you have bought these things you have to also maintain it and it's not always a long-term um, period to, to, to have maintenance from, from the outside of the country. So uh, this is also a step to develop the Iranian uh, industry a step further to uh, more modern um, um, manufacturing and other industrial um, future. You have to do that because there is yeah. a localization act in Iran, which requires 51% localization. Right. So this means in all our projects, uh, we have local partners, and our strategic partner at, at the moment, for example, for the locomotives is uh, MAPNA. For other projects, we are talking to other Iranian partners. So this is a must. Yeah. But apart from be being a must, how do you find working <laughs> with local um, partners in terms of the uh, c uh, capabilities and um, experience. Uh, if you, if it was not a must, would you still be working with them, or would there be another um, uh, option for you? No, I think Siemens uh, concerning localization. We do that in every country. We have uh, in Russia, in India, China, everywhere. We have our local setup, and also in Iran. Um, as mentioned, during sanctions, uh, we have on technology transfer with MAPNA. They are now able themselves to produce locomotives. And uh, this is our strategy. So for sure, we will invest in Iran and in all projects uh, 
At the moment, there is a tender about 630 metro cars in Iran, and we are talking to all uh, these four metro companies who are able to produce the metro cars in Iran. So it is uh, always our approach. What stakeholders do you think will have to be engaged, apart from the ones you must um, engage, what other stakeholders do you think you have to engage in Iranian market in order to make sure that this is a successful project? Well, um, I think it's uh, very easy actually to answer because the stakeholders are, are getting more and more important. Also for us to get uh, approval for the financing options, so the environmental and social impact that we have with our large infrastructure projects uh, are immense. So looking after the environment is definitely something that's in our genes, but looking after the societal impact, eh, there are fisheries probably that should uh, get a di different work area, other companies who are working there and while we're expanding ports or uh, having an effect on their lives. So that's something that needs to be taken into account, otherwise we're out of business. In a minute, uh, we're going to come to uh, the floor for, um, que for more questions. And I know I'm keeping you from lunch, which is now <laughs> probably, uh, well, actually, there are more sessions bef between this and, and lunch. Um, can, can, we, can you tell us a little bit more about the um, competition? Because there's huge, for example, in especially in rail, uh, with Alstom and Siemens now merging, if, if, I'm, if I'm correct, very just we heard quite recently. I know Alstom has also a lot of interest, has had historically in Iran's railway. H what, how will that work for Siemens uh, in future in the rain market? Also uh, in, in other uh, um, sectors as well, Europeans, so it's not just a port of Antwerp, but there's been, there's been some competition. How do you think you can, you can um, merge these interests, if at all, in order to be more successful in the rain market. Yeah, yeah. Concerning competition, we see a strong competition on behalf of Iranian companies. Oh. Price-wise, we have difficulties. And this is where uh, we see that also the government puts us under pressure that we have to be competitive also price-wise oh. with the Iranian companies. But um, the quality, you cannot compare our quality with uh, the quality of Iranian companies. Concerning multinationals, uh, we see for sure uh, Russians, Chinese, uh, but also European competitors coming into Iran, Koreans. Um, so, uh, but competition is, is okay, and we like competition, so we think we are competitive. And concerning Alstom, you have heard last week that we are going to merge, but the process will take more than one and a half years, mm -hmm. and then the decision will be taken through the antitrust author authorities. Sure. So local competition, serious, yes. um, at least in rail or in, in operation of ports? Uh, then you mean uh, on the other side, in, in, in Europe, uh, or do you no, mean no, here in Eden, in, in local? So, so uh, first I meant with other yeah. ports in Europe, working in Iran, but uh, we hear that also the local co uh, competition inside Iran from Iranian partners is also um, an issue to deal with. I, I think I, uh, I can agree with that. There are many projects of, of uh, new ports or, or new hubs uh, in place or, or uh, being discussed. Uh, I leave it up to, let's say, the uh, Iranians to decide, but there's one uh, factor which is easily forgotten. Even if uh, in Iran the ports reside under the Ministry of, of uh, Transport and Ports, uh, and obviously we went, when we came back to, uh, um, to uh, Iran, that was the first uh, meetings we, we had, and we cherished that very much. But at the end of the day, it's cargo that determines where and how ports should develop. It's not, uh, there are plenty of, uh, of uh, beautiful ports built that were amply used. I think it's cargo that determines. So if you look further ahead than a few years, if you look to the, towards the, uh, in the next decades, when indeed, uh, and it's more when than if, eh? when, let's say, this whole hinterland of, con of uh, neighboring countries, including <laughs> Iran, will uh, grow to its full potential, you will have a lot of cargo, and in fact, you need to consider, take that into consideration if you build whatever infrastructure, whether it's rail, road, or, or uh, uh, ports. Perfect. Now, any questions from uh, the floor? 
Yes, please. <laughs> There's a mic coming for you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kave Tagivara Pizmidi. Uh, Moini Giskov, you mentioned you know, the financing of infrastructure. I think I understood you said the Iranian side would rather prefer uh, Russian or Chinese investments. I mean, I wonder if they have the, the luxury to choose, you know, given the amount of money that Iran needs. Um, apart from that, would you have any idea as Siemens, you know, if just forget about the Rus Russia and China for a second, w would you have any options, solutions to do actually finance, uh, you know, infrastructure financing through Siemens or, you know, Europe, Germany? Um, we provided from the beginning in 2016, uh, we set up a banking club, and um, they were willing to finance all of our projects uh, package of 2.5 billion euros with energy and mobility department together. <coughs> so we are ready in order to bring finance into Iran, but at the moment uh, we see that the preference is not for European financing, not, not the German financing, but I think the banks has also to sit down together so our German banks and CBI in order to negotiate also the banking contracts together. They are not uh, as far as they could have been within the last one and a half years. So it seems that it takes a bit of time. But we are willing to provide finance from, from Germany, sure. Ambassador. Thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentation. Uh, you have been talking about uh, maritime and uh, land transportation network. And uh, basically, the, uh, the maritime network, uh, well described by the previous presentation, around the India, Persian, uh, Persian Gulf around the India, and then uh, Suez Canal and Mediterranean. And uh, uh, the eastbound network, uh, basically, uh, the one belt, one road. But uh, there have been uh, uh, informations, rumors, speculations, call them whatever you want, uh, that uh, there will be a, an interest uh, for Tehran in opening up a facility, a port uh, uh, facility. I, I don't know whether uh, a, a for a military operation, a military presence, or even more so a commercial presence on the Syrian Mediterranean coast so that a connection uh, through land, uh, through uh, Iraq, we know there is an highway or important road which is uh, built presently in southern Iraq. And with the stabilization of Syria and Iraq also, could open up a land corridor uh, to, bring, uh, to, 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 to bring merchandise to the Syrian coast and mean back to the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Is that a perspective which uh, makes sense uh, and may be significant in, in improving uh, the, the, uh, the general network on which uh, I uh, Iranian uh, merchant uh, lines and uh, uh, both maritime and, and, and terrestrial can operate? So the question is, uh, apart from all the opportunities we talked about inside Iran, uh, regionally with the corridor to the <coughs> east, are there any master plans uh, to create a transport corridor all the way to um, Syria? Uh, as far as I'm aware, on the Caspian side, yes, there are uh, opportunities, uh, mainly related to the oil and gas industry, and also the connection to Turkey. But since we were discussing earlier on uh, yeah, uh, the political instability of that area, uh, nothing has materialized yet. What, what I see is that I think the Chinese people want to do everything to avoid the Suez Canal because it's limited, it's also in a political more or less unstable uh, region, and so I think they would take all opportunities to avoid this uh, bottleneck in the transportation from uh, East Asia to into, into Europe. Um, yes, and I also agree in, in your opinion that uh, we have already different corridors set up, either the long way on the Trans-Siberian or through uh, Kazakhstan, so I think they will also look for another, let me say, southern link, so Silk Road, and maybe ending up in, in Turkey or in Romania, I don't know. But I think there are different opportunities mentioned also by the Caspian Sea, and I think we also have to look now for 
let me say, five or ten years into the future and look how the entire region will develop on the political um, base first and then to introduce also economical um, changes or improvements. So, uh, political stability first, corridors of that nature next. Yes. Uh, if I can follow from, from that question, actually, um, uh, I'm a little bit confused. I thought uh, the Chinese project was using a corridor that was going through Turkey, <coughs> and uh, the idea was also to build high-speed trains, uh, of which I haven't heard anything. Now, the Trans-Siberian connection is already working and uh, has significantly decreased the number of days it takes to ship goods from uh, China to, to Europe. And yet I hear that the humble corridor would go through the Caucasus, so I'm a little bit confused. Is the Turkish corridor still actual? Uh, is there Chinese money uh, uh, committed to, to that corridor, and in particular to build high-speed trains? So what, what Iran promotes at the moment is if you would go through Iran and use the Iran corridor, then you could save 18 days of mm -hmm. transportation. Um, and a thousand uh, dollars or I don't know euros I'm not sure uh, concerning costs um, so they want really to promote also the corridor through Iran um, we as the port of Antwerp are heavily uh, uh, involved in that uh, Belt and Road initiative uh, because it, it has it uh, it has a serious impact on, on the northwestern Europe ports mm -hmm. basically what uh, you see thousands of maps with all uh, rail connections going in the north, going in the south. But basically, the essence of the Belt and Road program is uh, uh, one uh, connection over the, the land and one uh, maritime connection with until northwest Europe. That is basically the idea. The downside for us as a port is that we don't figure in either of them today. So our goal is to connect into that uh, network, whether it's the rail connective side or the maritime. Because the maritime road uh, seeks connection through the Mediterranean ports. And if I may correct you, uh, does not involve avoiding the Suez Canal because it, it's the, 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 the picture they, uh, they give themselves mm -hmm. is through the Suez Canal to Piraeus or other uh, Mediterranean ports. Now, I think the essence of, of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is to give an alternative to maritime transport. I think that's a good initiative, mm -hmm. but uh, I think today the exact, let's say, uh, ideal route is not determined. Iran wants to be part of that, so do we and many other countries. I know that uh, our, our dear colleagues from Rotterdam are, let's say, uh, struggling with the same uh, issue mm -hmm. uh, as the port of Antwerp or Hamburg does. It, it, uh, we enjoy having a fantastic infrastructure which was created over many decades, even centuries. The lowlands have a very high uh, uh, reputation uh, for excellence in, in logistics. Uh, that is something that was built over decades or even centuries. Uh, we would not very much like to lose that position especially since the real heart of production and consumption lies very close uh, in Northwest Europe. Any last questions? I've been asked to finish this session right on the dot because we've been running late. So if there's any last burning questions, we have one more chance or we will be heading towards the breakout rooms in the m underneath the main hall. So we walk back where we came from and find out the next sessions. May I? I sure. May I, if there's no other question, there's one small remark because the topic of this, uh, this uh, session was creating a smart transportation network. And so I think one of the things that we haven't discussed and perhaps on the next occasion should discuss is not the hardware, but right. the software. I think one of the biggest challenges which we are facing is the internet of things and the impact yes. of, of digitalization yeah. on uh, ports. We are also very much looking into that matter. It's extremely important because you can develop 
the best of hardware, <coughs> but if the software is not there, we will have a very big problem. The opportunities actually lie in that domain, much more than only in the hardware. Yeah, we have, we have developed a master plan for Iran, and then we proposed also software tools from DBH, Bremen Ports, for example, <coughs> to Iran, so they know about those issues, and I think they are going to deal with it. Con concerning pr passenger transportation, we are also talking about intermodality platforms, and we are presenting the platforms which we as Siemens um, have uh, currently. So I think Iran is working on these software issues. I would also raise a, th a third dimension of complexity, which is administration, means that we have to have something in, in place like customs and other administrations which will re really want to work together with the right tools, with the right infrastructure to um, make import and export easier for all the countries we talked just about. Well, Iranian Customs uh, Authority has actually ma has made a good breakthrough to, to um, Digitalization. It's a one system whereby you can. They have they have um, combined most of the other um, um, portals into one. I hear, but the digitalization you mentioned actually is is you will be surprised. It's the same thing we heard all over and over again. It also in Hamburg. So again, it's a universal theme. And uh, it was interesting that on that note, when uh, one of the um, shipping companies we were talking to said, look, we are, we are very concerned that even one day Amazon, as such a big company that is delivering everything uh, you know, point to point, door to door, will even want to start the world's biggest shipping um, company. And then will start to buy ports. So it's a, it's a, it's a dominance of a companies which, is c which have come out of Silicon Valley and now threatening even uh, the big players um, like these in, in Europe. So time for Iran. Iran has a long time and uh, to, to, to maybe not so long to realize what it will want to do in that picture. Thank you very much, um, all the members of this panel. Uh,